Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Welcome, everyone. This is Steve Meisinger, your host for today's ISE webinar. Today I'm pleased that I have John Parson with us. And John, of course, is the president of NationalFutures.com, and he'll be talking about his person pivot points. So the title of this presentation is Candlestick and Pivot Point Strategies for FX Options. John's been trading in the markets for many decades. He and I have been around for about the same amount of years. So uh, we understand the markets pretty well. Uh, we're not always going to pick them perfectly, but we understand them well. And John will be talking about his person pivot points. Without further ado, I want to introduce John Person. Thanks a lot, Steve, and welcome, everybody. And uh, this is my first event with the ISE for 2011. As Steve and I were just uh, saying hello to each other, it's also, if you think about it, the second decade of the new millennium, which the first decade seemed to be, we just started everything on a negative note, right? I don't know if everyone recalls this. I mean, we come into 2000 starting the new millennium with the fear of Y2K, and then again with the terrorist attacks, and then the Chad problems with the presidential election, which was just, you know, according to the world, an embarrassment of how democracy worked. You know, everything, we had the financial crisis, we had this crisis, that crisis. It just seemed that everything was a crisis. The stock market melted down, the worst... Uh, returns ever, uh, just all kinds of things were, were really uh, in everybody's face, so to speak. But the one thing that I think has, has actually, out of that positive has happened, is that a lot of traders have more uh, broad-based education and taking control of their own trading skills. Uh, technology has improved the way we deliver not only a seminar series like this, but also the quality has improved. In addition to that, the, the markets that we, we trade have changed in, in, to some degree. And one of the markets that we're talking about right now has changed. We've gone from trading foreign currency futures 30 years ago at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to where people were trading um, foreign currencies on a spot open market through you know, dealers, which was considered to be a, a, a wild, wild west is because the dealers were taking the other sides of the trade. There was no transparency. Then the advent of ETFs, and of course now with ISEs, index um, and ETFs for foreign currencies. And one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about is that through all these changes, the one methodology that I've used throughout the last 30 years that still stands true to this day, and I mean right now, today, is in using candlestick and pivot analysis. And my forte, I've really gone through with pivot point analysis, and we'll show that to you today in our presentation. And I'm also going to enlighten you of something that I don't think I've ever expanded on uh, before to the uh, ISE's audience, is a concept of using pivots in different time periods. And I, I know you're probably thinking, oh, person, we've heard this before, the daily and weekly, and probably you've heard me talk about monthly pivots before. But I've got another avenue that we, we're going to explore with you that we've been doing with some other brokerage firms and some of my um, work. And, and I think it's going to be interesting. The concept is instead of using a calendar month, if we're using options, which Let's face it, there's another thing that has changed in the last 10 years is the way people accept and use options in their trading approach. Um, and now when we look at options, as we look at monthly calendar data, one thing that happens is we all realize that options expire before a calendar month concludes. So therefore, we've, we use a, a new concept, or relatively new, might be new for you, but a new concept in pivot analysis using a option expiration monthly calendar. So it goes from the expiration of one 
Mark, uh, cycle to the next. So if the third Friday of every month is an option expiration instead of the end of the calendar month, uh, like yesterday, Monday, January 31st was the end of the calendar month, we instead use both the calendar month and also and the option expiration calendar. And so I think that's something that's kind of intriguing. We'll show you some results, some back test stuff here using the uh, ISE's Euro X index, and because right now the euro currency is seen, I mean, what seems to be really amazing and true to the volatility of the marketplace, just three weeks ago, people thought that the euro currency and the eurozone was going to fall apart and that the euro was going to, you know, dissipate uh, because of the problems in Greece and Italy and Portugal and the lack of contribution with Spain. Whereas France and Germany were, you know, the bulk of the manufacturing sector and, and the uh, 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 the contributors for the eurozone, and so this is obviously a turnabout as we see today's prices uh, exceed over the 138 handle in the in the euro currency, and we see the um, euro uh, FX index back to the 72 region. So we're going to show you that today from a live trading account. But first, I'd like to go through and explain to you um, what some of these. Um, examples are and where we get the information and how we combine the two to make better trading decisions. Um, for sakes of uh, disclosure and also to let you know in case you're not familiar, uh, trading's risky. And you can read this uh, disclosure, which by law the ISE and myself as a commodity trading advisor, the government would like us to let you know um, that trading is risky, options are risky, and uh, if you want a um, Full disclosure of this, you can simply review it on the recording. Um, in addition to that, this information is educational in purpose, and by law, I have to submit this disclaimer. There's no warranty of profits of using any of these methods that I'm teaching. This is for education in purpose only, and the use of stop loss, and for whatever reason, many of you may know, stops uh, probably don't work all the time, and the government wants me to let you know that. Um, about the ISE FX options, just real briefly, um, they are accessible through uh, your securities options broker or their exchange listed securities. They're cash settled in U.S. dollars. They have European style exercise, and you can trade them as spreads. Uh, the currencies that they currently list are the Australian dollar, the Brazilian real, the British pound, the Canadian dollar, the euro, as we're going to go show you today, Japanese yen, the peso, the New Zealand dollar, the Swedish krona, and, of course, the Swiss franc. And they also have um, the reverse with the uh, EUU versus the EUI, which is more – people are probably more familiar with the um, euro currency dollar – index, which is indicative of the spot foreign currency market. So I'll show you that as well in today's presentation. And if you're watching currencies, that probably might be something that you would be paying attention to uh, if you're looking at the foreign currencies to identify with the EUU versus the um, euro currency unit index, uh, which is kind of quoted in dollars to euro currency. It's a little bit confusing, but uh, when we get to our charts, you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, the first thing that I want to discuss, because quite frankly, my work goes hand in hand. There is not any one indicator that I use all in of it by itself. Uh, I generally look at not only the health of the market as volume studies would show over time, I don't put a lot of reliability in just volume studies. And one of the main reasons, folks, is this. Volume can be masked. It can be masked by the various products that we're capable of trading. An individual can look at buying uh, an individual security or an individual derivative product. Let's take, for example, the euro currency. You could buy it through the banks in the spot market, through the futures market, through a futures options, through an ETF, and also through the ISEs uh, index using options. So 
there's several different ways to put a position down. So while if you're looking at only one product, volume might not look all that appealing, but one can spread out a huge position amongst various different derivative assets uh, of similar like means, such as instead of buying futures, I can buy options instead of buying, but I can still be a bullish trader. And so volume in of itself is not one of the greatest indicators anymore. And that is my opinion and, and my explanation as to why. But one of the, the indicators that I absolutely like and, and, and look at is advancing versus declining volume. And that gives me a better, truer picture of the overall markets, per se. I also like to look at a cash flow indicator. M many people aren't familiar with the Chaikin cash flow index. And what's interesting about that is it takes a look at uh, the close as it relates to the overall range, the high and low. And as we get into looking at candlesticks and as we get into looking at pivot analysis, What's interesting about that concept is when we see a candlestick, we're looking at what? The close as it relates to not just the opening, but also the overall range. And when we look at pivot analysis, by the pivot point analysis I refer to as the mathematical model that gives us a weighted value of typical price by taking the sum of the high, the low, and the close, adding it up and dividing it by three. Once again, the three main components, high, low, and the close. And the close as it relates to the overall range is important. So by looking at those three elements, there's other indicators that I think are a little bit better that can help traders uh, uncover possibly hidden value number one or momentum number two, or loss of momentum, or momentum that may be starting to change. And that's important. And the reason it's important, because it A, it'll help me to identify a potential change in direction, strength, or the condition of the trend. It'll also help me to identify if there's a loss of momentum that I should be maybe cutting back positions and taking profits, which is something so many traders struggle with. So at this point in time, when we look at candlestick analysis, it's, it's really important not to really look at some of the candle patterns. And I know that I've written several books on candlesticks and pivot analysis, and some of you might be familiar with my work, and that we look for certain patterns like a high-closed doji, low-closed doji, uh, the benchmark pillar of strength, looking at hammers. And, and we've done a, a, an in-depth back test study on the frequency and reliability of what candle pattern mostly forms at the tops and bottoms of markets. We did this back test study in my second book entitled Candlestick and Pivot Points Trading Triggers. And it was really amazing as we broke it down for the different markets such as uh, the stocks, bonds, gold, and foreign currencies. And we found that there was a high relevance or high frequency of occurring bottoms and tops with hammers and shooting stars as well as doji. So just focusing on a doji, a hammer, and a shooting star really in increased our, our probabilities of identifying what the potential high or low might be. And when it comes right down to it, by identifying this, by using candlesticks, candlesticks also gave me a better visualization technique by identifying in not only shape, size, but color, the relationship between open and close. And our chart on our left shows a white or hollow candle, which shows that the close is greater than the open. And for me, folks, I like to identify a bullish market condition by several factors, which I'll give to you right now. One, I like to see the close greater than the open. To me, that does signify a stronger market. Two, I like to see the close closer to the high. And number three, I like to see the close obviously greater than past or prior closes, but to really truly identify strong positive momentum, I like to see the current bars close greater than past or prior highs. That's one of the things that we really emphasize and teach our traders. So 
there is a few other things that we like to point out and look at besides just looking at a higher high and a higher low. Most people say, hey, the market's bullish. Look, it's making a higher high and a higher low. But really what defines the condition isn't just a higher high or a higher low. What defines the condition is if the close is greater than the open, if the close is closer to the high, and if the close is above past or prior highs. That's what really helps me to identify that there's a strong momentum building in the marketplace. The chart on our right signifies at the market a dark candle. Many of you would look at this and see, if you're looking at a color chart, see this is a red candle where the close is less than the open. And just the opposite of looking at a bullish market condition, this would signify we're in at least this time frame a more negative or at least a bearish biased market condition because the close is less than the open and the close is closer to the low. And for me, I don't just look at lower highs and lower lows. I like to look at what is the true condition of this bearishness of the market. Is the close less than the open? Is the close closer to the low? And is the close less than past or prior lows? That's what really helps me to identify if the market is in a true bearish market condition. So again, on our left-hand side, many of you would see a green candle on your charts if the close is greater than the open. And of course, a red candle would signify if the close is less than the open on many of your trading platforms. So what's important is that when we look at candlestick characteristics, we are looking at which is very important, the relationship between the open and close, we call that the real body. Obviously, the real body's color, red or green, and if there are any shadows or correlations of the shadows to the candle's body. Is it a large candle body? Is it a large open-close range relationship? Or is it a narrow range open-close relationship? What are the size of shadows? What's the range or overall length of the candle? So we can identify what type of buying or selling pressure really truly exists by just looking at the color, the size, and the shape, and the depth of candlesticks. And we all have equal access to that four bits of information which comprise a candlestick, the open, the high, the low, and the close. But they should be used with other non-correlated confirming indicators. Now, we have a lot of patterns that we look at, evening doji stars, the uh, harami doji cross, the bearish engulfing, very reliable patterns, dark cloud. These are all at the very top, very bearish reversal formations, but we need to look for confirming indicators. These help to identify when we see these patterns that they're the positive momentum or the bullish trend may be waning. Of course, as far as a bullish pattern, we see morning doji stars form bottoms. We see bullish piercing patterns, the hammer, as I've discussed just a few moments ago, and, of course, bullish engulfing. These are more of my favorite and yet reliable, more reliable patterns. I think Steve mentioned it best when he introduced. Both Steve and I have a lot of experience in the market. Um, you know, we're not going to always get every trade right but at least we have the ability to identify when a trade goes wrong if it has the probabilities and the characteristics of momentum moving in a positive direction. And if we are along the market, if that positive momentum starts to wane, then we need to take action and get out. And I think instead of hoping and praying, oh, I'm sure it'll go my way, let me wait another day, I think a good trader identifies that the trade's not working, it's not performing as it should and can cut the trade or at least reduce their exposure or possibly get out, if not, possibly hedge or spread off their position to avoid disaster. So I think a good trader obviously identifies if a market is going to move, it should move almost immediately. If you get a bullish reversal pattern, you should see follow through momentum to the upside. When there's a lack of that momentum, that's when you need to take action. Maybe cut your position down, take something off the table, and monitor the trade more closely. That's what traders virtually do. Part of this business isn't about getting in and out all the time and taking a lot of action. Part of this business is about 
monitoring, waiting, and observing. This is about the only business I know where you really do get paid to wait. You get paid to wait for the right setup, and you get paid to wait to watch the trade mature. That's the key. You have to wait for the trade to mature and ride the trend. Nothing goes straight up and straight down in one second. You've got to ride the trade a little bit. And that's where patience comes from. And more importantly, identifying candle patterns can help us to either act or sit tight. Now, when we look at certainly the EUU, and when we look at this chart in front of us, and we notice that we get, um, and I'm going to write this in here, and I'm going to use a blue color. See, as the market starts to move higher, and then we start to move lower, and let me use a different color that does not seem to work well. From this point to this point, as you can see, we get a doji bottom formation. Now, at this point, notice that the market is making what? It's making lower highs. It's making lower lows. But internally, notice that the market stopped as we see this gap and this gap higher opening. The market still closed, even though this is a red candle. Let me uh, erase this. Even though the market closed closer to the low, right, as you see right here, it still closed above the high of that doji. So then obviously we get the next day we see an ensuing bullish momentum turnaround. If one was still looking at being short the market at this point, by this time frame with a bullish breakout momentum in the market, truly identifying that the doji formed a bottom in the market, that information may be helpful to identify that there is and was a change in momentum in the market. I mean, some traders might make fatal mistakes and say, I'm sure it'll come back. I'll just add on to a short. I'll just keep selling. And then they feel a little bit relieved here. And then again, the market continues higher and it just becomes a disaster. I think it's really important to identify what the overall trend is doing, number one. And number two, it's very important to look at the health of the market. And that by looking and identifying that, if the market is truly bearish and should go down, we should not be forming doji formations. Dojis actually form uh, major tops and major bottom reversal patterns. And as you can see clearly, this red candle, even though it's a red candle, it's still closed positive above the high of that doji. We call that in our teachings and written in our book a HCD. That's considered a high-closed doji pattern. Now, I think that it's important that if we could overlay some hidden support and resistance targets, that is a different layer that gives us that secondary confirmation other than just using candlesticks in of themselves. One goes with the other. And if you're not familiar with pivot points, they are a mathematical model. We use them to uh, identify potential daily, weekly, and monthly ranges based on those time frames. And as I'll show you today, uh, we like to use other calendar or other time frame events, namely option expiration date. Now, there are several different formulas out there. I know that people use all sorts now, as I understand it, that there's R, even an R4 value that gives us four targets of resistance, and we get an S4 which would give us four targets of support. And I know a lot of people like to use these midpoint numbers. Um, personally, I find using all of this information a little cumbersome and a little bit burdensome because there's just too much data on my charts. What I've created and helped to develop is the person's pivots is a filtering mechanism by using a moving average. And if the market is deemed to be bullish, well, instead of 
looking at all these targets of support and resistance if the market trend is in an up mode. And let's take a look at this. We see a higher high. We see higher lows, right? We see that the close is greater than the open. The close is closer to the high of that current bar. And more importantly, the close is greater than the past high and the close is greater than the past close. So this would be a good definition of a bullish, healthy condition. And then the next bar, the same thing. We see a higher low, we see a higher high, the close is greater than the open. More importantly, you see that the close is closer to the high. In addition, notice that the close is greater than past or prior closes. In addition, the current bar's close is greater than past or prior highs. Do you see what I'm drawing? That the close is broken out of this over or past resistance area. I'm kind of getting a little crazy with my drawing tool. Sorry, but as this close is greater than those highs, it's showing that there was positive momentum, that this is a healthy, a more bullish condition in the marketplace. So if the market truly is bullish, then we probably should see a higher high the next time period and maybe a higher low. And if we took this value, the high, the low, and the close, and threw it in a pivot calculator, these would be about rep a good representation of the location of the predicted support and resistance targets. So if I'm bullish and I want to anticipate, well, what might tomorrow's high be? Well, if we're bullish, we'd look at R2, and the support just might be near S1. And so isn't that lining up for us in advance what tomorrow's potential range might be? So that's where I came up with this filtering method and the observation that every time I saw the market in a bullish state, it was giving me an R2, S1 layout. And the opposite is true for, or the reverse is kind of true for bearishness. We would get an R1 and an S2 for a bearish outlook. So that is A, how we came to the conclusion of helping to filter out bullish or bearish points using the pivot analysis. Now, how do we spot these reversals near pivot support? Well, easy. If we get a predicted pivot support target on our charts, I'm not going to look to be a buyer until the market tests that area and gives us some kind of price action as the market's starting to move up that bounces off support. And something could be as simple as maybe a high closed doji where the market finally as it moves lower, we get a doji, and a candlestick on an intraday basis or an end-of-day basis gives us a bullish momentum by closing over the high of the doji. That was one method. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.